Good morning, old sport. You having lunch with me today? And I thought we'd ride up together. He was balancing himself on the dashboard of his car with that resourcefulness of movement that is so pecu pecu peculiar American that comes, I suppose, with the absence of lifting work or rigid sitting in youth, and even more with the formless grace of our nerve, nervous sporadic games. This quality was continually breaking through his punctiliously manner in the shape of restlessness. He was never quite still. There was always a tapping foot somewhere, the impatient opening and closing of a hand. He saw me looking with admiration at his car. It's pretty, isn't it, old sport? He jumped off to give me a better view. Haven't you ever seen it before? I'd seen it. Everybody had seen it. It was a rich cream color, bright and nickel, swollen here and there in its monstrous length of triumphant hat boxes and supper boxes and tool boxes. And terrace with a labyrinth of windshields that mirrored a dozen suns. Sitting down behind many lay layers of glass in a sort of green leather conservatory, we started to town. I talked with him perhaps a half a dozen times in the past month and found to my disappointment that he had little to say. So my first impression, that he was a person of some undefined consequence, had gradually faded, and he had been simply the proprietor of an elaborate roadhouse next door. All right, we're going to stop there. Let's go ahead and look over the question. So, all right. All right, a uh, couple here. If we look here, the first question asks you, uh, the introductory section of Chapter 4 is a long roster of those who attended Gatsby's parties. How do they behave toward their host? Why do they accept his hospitality? So this kind of starts off early on. We look at the beginning of the chapter. It's talking about the first couple of people. They talk again. They start gossiping about him, these young ladies. Uh, he killed a man. He's a bootlegger. He's to von Hindenburg and second cousin of the devil. He's not hes not a good person. And yet they're still wanting to be here with all these people. Um, it's, you know, it's basically the idea of, well, he is the famous person with money and anyone who's anybody is going to be there. It's why people show up to, you know, these big Hollywood celebrity parties and think, you know, if I, if I can spend time, whoever this person is, they have a lot of money and they're famous, maybe it rubs off on me. It's all about company. You know, in the last uh, was it chapter two or chapter three where he had Tom and Myrtle, how Myrtle acts, you know, very high society, and she's not. But she she concerns herself with her appearance, and she's like, I, I'm better than everyone because I have this kind of company. And when it doesn't go that way, she has problems. It's the same thing here. These people are like anyone who's anybody is going to be at Gatsby's party. So why, you know, I should be there. So there you go. All right. Number two, who is Kip, Kip Springer? Who is he referred to as? If we go down here, that is in our big list of people. Kip Springer. Here we go. Right down bottom of 67. A man named Kilp Springer was there so often, so long he became known as the border. I doubt if he had any other home. So the reason uh, Kip Springer is one of the guests and he's referred to as the border because he stays there so much. So now we get to Gatsby's car, number three. Let's take a look. Just introduce that. We're not going to... Describe Gatsby's cars. If you go on past the list of people, see him, he brought this car out. Here you go. It was a rich cream color, bright with nickel, swollen here and there. It's monstrous length. So it's shiny, it's cream colored, it's bright, and it's long, apparently. That's why it's a monstrous length. So uh, it's got all these windshields, as many layers of glass and a green leather. So it's a very nice car, very fancy car. And I think it looks like Gatsby's very proud of it because he makes a point to point this out to Nick. All right, so that's questions one through three. Now we're getting into a little more about Gatsby's past because he does have a past. So let's see what kind of details he talks about. <clears throat> then... And then came that disconcerting ride. We hadn't reached West Egg Village before Gatsby began leaving his elegant sentences unfinished and slapping himself indecisively on the knee of his caramel-colored suit. 
Look here, old sport, he broke out surprisingly. What's your opinion of me, anyhow? A little overwhelmed, I began the generalized evasions which that question deserves. Well, I'm going to tell you something about my life, he interrupted. I don't want you to get a wrong idea of me from all these stories you hear. So he was aware of the bizarre accusations that flavored conversation in his halls. I'll tell you God's truth. His right hand suddenly ordered divine retribution to stand by. I am the son of some wealthy people in the Midwest. Middle West, all dead now. I was brought up in America, but educated at Oxford, because all my ancestors have been educated there for many years. It is a family tradition. He looked at me sideways. I knew why Jordan Baker had believed he was lying. He heard the phrase, educated Oxford, or swallowed it and choked on it, as though it had bothered him before. And with this doubt, his whole statement fell to pieces, and I wonder if there wasn't something a little sinister about him after all. What part of the Middle West? I inquired casually. San Francisco. I see. The family all died. I came into a great deal of money. His voice was suddenly solemn, as if the memory of that sudden extinction of the clan still haunted him. For a moment, I suspect he was pulling my leg, but a glance at him convinced me otherwise. After that, I lived like a young Raja in all the capitals of Europe. Paris, Venice, Rome, collecting jewels, chiefly rubies, hunting big game, painting a little things for myself only, trying to forget something very sad that happened to me long ago. Uh, Raja is like a uh, Middle Eastern, um, I think it's Middle Eastern, like in uh, like a prince, basically. Uh, he's, you know, he's getting a chance, he, you know, he's doing whatever he wanted at the time, collecting jewels, hunting, painting, doing things for himself. With an effort, I managed to restrain my incredulous laughter. Uh, basically, that he doesn't believe him. The very phrases were worn on th so threadbare that they evoked no image except that of a turbid character leaking sawdust at every pore as he pursued a tiger through the Bois de Villon. Then came the war, old sport. It was a great relief. I tried very hard to die, but I seemed to bear an enchanted life. I accepted a commission as first lieutenant when it uh, began. In the Argonne Forest, I took two machine gun detachments so far forward there was a half mile gap on either side of us where the infantry couldn't advance. We stayed there two days and two nights. 130 men with 60 Lewis guns. When the infantry came up at last, they found the insignia, uh, insignia of three German divisions among the piles of the dead. I was promoted to be a major, and every Allied government gave me a decoration. Even Montenegro, little Montenegro down the Adriatic Sea. <laughs> little Montenegro. He lifted up the words and nodded at them, his smile. The smile comprehended Montenegro's troubled history and sympathized, sympathized, sympath sympathized with the brave struggles of the Montenegrin people. It appreciated fully the chain of natural circumstance which had elicited this tribute from Montenegro's little warm heart. My incredulity was submerged in fascination now. It was like skimming hastily through a dozen magazines. Sorry. He reached into his pocket and a piece of metal swung on a ribbon fell into my palm. That one's from Montenegro. To my astonishment, the thing had an authentic look. Orde de Danilo ran the circular legend. Montenegro, Nicholas Rex, turn it. Major J. Gadsby, I read, for valor extraordinary. Here's another thing I always carry, a souvenir of Oxford days. It was taken in Trinity Quad, the man on my left now is the Earl of Dorcaster. It was a photo of half a dozen young men in blazers, loafing in an archway through which was visible a host of spires. There was Gadsby, looking a little, not much, younger, with a cricket bat in, cricket bat in his hand. Then it was all true. I saw the skins of tigers flaming in his palace on the Grand Canal. I saw him opening a chest of rubies to ease, with their crimson lighted depths, the gnawings of his broken heart. I'm going to make a request of you today, he said, pocketing his souvenirs with satisfaction. So I thought you ought to know something about me. I didn't want you to think I was just some nobody. You see, I usually find myself among strangers because I drift here, and they're trying to forget the sad little thing that happened to me, he hesitated. You'll hear about it this afternoon. At lunch? No, this afternoon. I've been to find out that you're taking Miss Baker to tea. You mean you're in love with Miss Baker? No, old sport, I'm not. But Miss Baker has kindly consented to speak to you about this matter. I have the faintest idea what this matter was. I was more annoyed than interested. Oh, I hadn't asked Jordan to tea in order to discuss Mr. J. Gadsby. I was sure the request would be something utterly fantastic, and for a moment I was so sorry I had ever set foot upon his overpopulated lawn. He wouldn't say another word. His correctness grew on him as we entered as we neared the city. 
We passed Port Roosevelt, where there was a glimpse of red-belted ocean-going ships. It sped along a column slum lined with the dark, unde undeserted saloons of the faded gilt 1900s. Then the Valley of Ashes opened out on both sides of us. I had a glimpse of Miss Wilson straining at the gas pump with panting vitality as we went by. The fender spread like wings. We scattered through light through half... We scattered light through half Astra, only half, for as we twisted among the pillars to the elevated, I heard the familiar jug-jug spat of a motorcycle, and the frantic policeman rode alongside. All right, old sport, called Yasby. We slowed now. Taking a white card from his wallet, he waved it before the end, waved it before the man's eyes. Right you are, agreed the policeman, tipping his cap. Know you next time, Mr. Gadsby. Excuse me? What was that? I inquired. Picture of Oxford? I was able to do the commissioner a favor once, and he sends me a Christmas card every year. So, basically, it's Gadsby throwing his weight around for speed. Over the great bridge with sunlight through the, through the girders, making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, with the city rising up on the river in white heaps and sugar lumps all built with a wish out of non-olfactory money. The city seen from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city seen for the first time, in its first wild promise of all the mystery and beauty in the world. A dead man passed us in the hearse heaped with blooms, followed by two carriages with drawn blinds, and by more cheerful carriages for friends. The friends looked out on us with tragic eyes and the short upper lips of southern eastern Europe, and I was glad that the sight of Gatsby's splendid car was included in their somber holiday. As we crossed Blackwell's Island, a limousine passed us, driven by a white chauffeur, in which sat three modish negroes, two bucks and a girl. I laughed out loud as the yokes of their eyeballs rolled toward us in haughty rivalry. Anything can happen now that we slid over this bridge, I thought. Anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen without any particular wonder. All right, we're going to pause there for a moment. Go over to the questions. So we left off on number five. Nope, sorry, number four. Discuss the details that Gatsby shares with Nick about his past. So he talks about Oxford. If we scroll back towards... The beginning part talks about Oxford, sorry, Oxford, talks about how he's from the Middle West originally, and all his family died, he was brought up in America, and then sent to Oxford to be educated, and it was a family tradition. He started in San Francisco, and then they all died, and then he went to all these places in Europe, and then eventually went into the war, got recognized a commendation for uh, something he did in Montenegro. And then he even shows him the medal. So he tells him all these things he did, apparently, of this fascinating life he's led. Now, does Nick believe Gatsby's story? Why or why not? Well, as we start out, he doesn't. You think his, you know, he kind of stumbles over his details uh, right here on 70, right here. Starts talking about how he, he knew why Jordan Baker thought he was lying. He'd heard these phrases, wondered if there wasn't something sinister about him. And then he begins to believe him because he actually shows him proof. He shows him the medal from the war, and he shows him the picture at Oxford, and he starts to believe it. So does he believe them? Maybe not at first, but by the end, he gets it. He believes it, it seems like. All right, what does Gatsby say about his time in the military? Well, he says a couple things. So we go back right here, 71. Then came the world sport. It was a great relief, and he tried very hard to die. You know, if you're trying very hard to die, generally that means you're not being careful. And yet he says he lived an enchanted life. So that either means he was being careful or he wasn't because he clearly lived. And he talks about how he had this... Uh, great moments in the war and apparently saved everyone and was promoted a major. All these governments gave him a declaration. So he even brings out one of the ones he got, this medal for valor extraordinaire. So very interesting about his time in the war. And what does he show Nick as proof of his military service? Well, that's the medal. That's this uh, Orde de Danilo... Montenegro Nicholas Rex, and then it has his name on it. It's for Valor Extraordinary. All right. Uh, right. What does he show as proof of his Oxford days? That's the picture. There's a photo of half a dozen young men in blazers loafing in an archway. 
He even calls it a souvenir of Oxford. In the Trinity Quad, this is a spot in Oxford. Uh, now how does uh, number nine, sorry, I should really say the numbers of these. Uh, how does Gatsby get out a speeding ticket on the way to the city? He shows, now this is where sort of around where we stopped. He's going a little fast. It's uh, bottom of 73, 274. Taking a white card on his wallet, he waited before the man's eyes. Uh, I was able to do the Christmas, the commissioner a favor once, and he sends me a Christmas card every year. So he waves a Christmas card signed by the commissioner. Uh, basically just name drops with a Christmas card. It's crazy to me. Uh, and that's where we stop. So now we're going to learn about Meyer Wolsheim. It's going to be interesting. So again, things to keep in mind about Gatsby is he has a tendency to want to show off, at least right now. Um, I mean, speeding, you know, talking about his time in the war, talking about his time in Oxford. It's not necessarily that he's lying, but he is kind of, kind of, not even humble bragging. He's just bragging. So this is a lot about his character and the kind of person he is. Alrighty, here we go. Uh, Roaring Noon, in a well-fanned 42nd cellar, I met Gatsby for lunch. Looking away the brightness of the street outside, my eyes picked him out obscurely in the ante room, talking to another man. Mr. Carraway, this is my friend, Mr. Wolfsheim. A small, flat-nosed Jew raised his large head and regarded me with two fine growths of hair, which luxuriated in either nostril. After a moment, I discovered his tiny eyes and half darkness. Basically, this guy's got big eyebrows. <laughs> Um, no, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. It's his nose hair. Um, oh man, just the, just the image is hilarious to me. Uh, so I took one look at him, said Mr. Wolfsheim, shaking his, my hand earnestly. What do you think I did? What? I inquired politely. Evidently he was not addressing me for he dropped my hand and covered Gatsby with his expressive nose. I handed the money to Katzpa, and I said, All right, Katzpa, don't pay him a penny till he shuts his mouth. He shut it then and there. Gatsby took an arm of each of us and moved forward into the restaurant, whereupon Mr. Wolfsheim swallowed a new sentence he was starting and lapsed into a sonimbolectory abstraction. Hi, Balls, asked the head waiter. This is a nice restaurant here, said Mr. Wolfsheim, looking at the Presbyterian nymphs on the ceiling, but I like it across the street better. Yes, Hi, Balls, agreed Gatsby. Uh, then to Mr. Wolfsheim, it's too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, said Mr. Wolfsheim. Full of memories. Just a note, highballs means, I, th I believe it's like really high proof alcohol. So, uh, thing to remember is alcohol uh, is, uh, you know, it's a big deal right now. So, highball is just another word for, I think, very ex either expensive or like high, very strong alcohol. I can't remember which. Uh, anyway, what place is that, I asked. The old Metropole. The old Metropole, approved Wolfsheim grimly. Filled with faces, dead and gone. Filled with friends, gone now forever. I can't forget so long as I lived the night they shot Rosie Rothensall there. It was six of us at the table, and Rosie had eaten drunk a lot all evening. It was almost morning, the waiter come to him with a funny look and said, Someone wants to speak to him outside. All right, said Rosie. He begins to get up, and I pulled him down in his chair. The bastards come in here if they want you, Rosie, but don't you so help me move outside this room. It was four o'clock in the morning then, and if we'd have raised the blinds, we'd have seen daylight. Did he go? I asked innocently. Sure, he went. Mr. Olsheim's nose flashed at me indignantly, turned around in the door and said, Don't let the waiter take away my coffee. And then he went out on the sidewalk, and they shot him three times in his full belly and drove away. Four of them were electrocuted, I remem said, remembering. Five with Becker, his nostrils turned to me in an interested way. I understand you're looking for a business, Gonington. The juxtapose of those two remarks was startling. Gatsby answered for me. Oh, no, he exclaimed. This isn't the man. No, Mr. Wolfsheim seemed disappointed. This is just a friend. I told you we'd talk about that some... Uh, hold on. Text has decided to go and mess up, so give me one second here. Anyway, so let's look over the questions for a minute. So who is Meyer Wolfsheim? He's a friend of Gadsby's and apparently is well-to-do. He's Jewish and has very hairy nostrils, <laughs> apparently. Uh, something that Nick keeps commenting on. 
what story does he recall about Rosie Rochal? Um, he talks about how Rosie Rochal, Rosenthal, sorry, I keep saying his name wrong. Rosie Rosenthal, uh, it was, he talked about how he was murdered, um, shot outside the restaurant. What does this show about Wolfsheim's character? Well, talks about how this gentleman was, sh uh, was this a gentleman? Yes, was shot and talks about how he, he has a lot of people he's lost. All right, scroll on down to the 70s pages. So make sure you're staying cut up. All right, don't want to fall behind. Although, I mean, this is a video. You could pause it if you want. Here we go. All right. Uh, oh, no, he exclaimed. This isn't the man. No, Mr. Wolfsheim seemed disappointed. This is just a friend. I told you we'd talk about that some other time. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Wolfsheim. I had a wrong man. Now, um, that should be kind of interesting because it's clear that he started talking about uh, business and uh, so obviously something he didn't want to talk to just anyone about. So that's something to really think about. Uh, why Why would Gatsby be bothered by Nick not knowing what was going on? Just something to think about. I beg your pardon, said Wolfsheim, Mr. Wolfsheim. I had the wrong man. A succulent hash arrived, and Mr. Wolfsheim, forgetting the more sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, rose slowly around the room. He completed the arc by turning to inspect the people directly behind think that, except for my presence, he would have taken one short glance behind, beneath our own table. Look here, old sport, I said, Gatsby leaning toward me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. There was a smile again. This time I held out against it. I don't like mysteries, I answered. I don't understand why you won't come out frankly and tell me what you want. Why has this all got to come through Miss Baker? Oh, it's nothing underhand, he assured me. Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and she'd never do anything that wasn't all right. So then he looked at his watch, jumped up, and hurried from the room, leaving me and Mr. Wolfsheim at the table. He has to telephone. <clears throat> he has to telephone, said Mr. Wolfsheim, following him with his eyes. Fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome to look at and a perfect gentleman. Yes, he's an Oxford man. Oh, uh, this is just uh, Wolfsheim's way of saying Oxford, by the way, the, the school. He went to Oxford College in England. You know Oxford College? I've heard of it. It's one of the most famous colleges in the world. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? I inquired. Several years, he answered in a gratified way. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war, but I knew I discovered a man of fine breeding after I talked with him an hour. I said to myself, there's the kind of man you'd like to take home and introduce to your mother and sister. He paused. I see you're looking at my cuff buttons. I hadn't been looking at them, but I did know. They were composed of oddly familiar pieces of ivory. Finest specimens of human molars, he informed me. Those are teeth, by the way. Back teeth. Ooh. Nice teeth. Well, Inspector, that's a very interesting idea. Yeah. He flipped his sleeves up under his coat. Yeah, Gatsby's very careful about women. He would never so much as look at a friend's wife. When the subject of this instinctive trust returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolfsheim drank his coffee with a jerk and got to his feet. I've enjoyed my lunch, he said. I'm going to run off from two, two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Meyer, said Gatsby without enthusiasm. Mr. Wolfsheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction. You're very polite, but I belong to another generation, he announced solemnly. You sit here and discuss your sports and your young ladies and your... He supplied an imaginary noun with another wave of his hand. As for me, I am 50 years old, and I won't impose myself on you any longer. As he shook hands and turned away, his tragic nose was trembling. I wondered if I had said something to offend him. He becomes very, very sentimental sometimes, explained Gatsby. This is one of his sentimental days. He's quite a character around New York, a denizen of Broadway. Who is he anyhow? An actor? No. A dentist? Meyer Wolfsey? No, he's a gambler. Gatsby hesitated. And added coolly, he's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fixed the World Series? The idea staggered me. I remember, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919, but if I had thought of it at all, I would have thought it was a thing that miraculously happened. The end of some inevitable chain. Never occurred to me that one man could start playing with the famous with the sorry, one man could start to play with the faith of fifty million people, with the single mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. How did he happen to do that? I asked after a minute. He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? They can't get him, old sport. He's a smart man. 
very interesting that uh, Gatsby has this admiration for someone who clearly is a criminal by fixing the World Series, a very famous uh, crime that was committed. Um, in this in this world, so it's kind of interesting that Gatsby seems to admire him, calling him smart. I insisted on paying the check. As the waiter brought my change, I caught sight of Tom Buchanan across the crowded room. Come along with me for a minute, I said. I've got to say hello to someone. When he saw us, Tom jumped up and took half a dozen steps in our direction. Uh, where have you been, he demanded eagerly. Daisy's furious because you haven't called up. This is Mr. Gadsby, Mr. Buchanan. He shook hands briefly, and a strained, unfamiliar look of embarrassment came over Gadsby's face. Have you been anyhow, demanded Tom of me. How'd you happen to come up this far to eat? Been having lunch with Mr. Gadsby. I turned towards Mr. Gadsby. He was no longer there. <clears throat> So, kind of interesting how he reacted to Tom, given who Tom's wife is. Something to think about. One October day in 1917, said Jordan Baker that afternoon, sitting up very straight on a straight chair in the tea garden at the Plaza Hotel. I was walking along from one place to another, half on the sidewalks and half on the lawns. I was happier on the lawns because they had shoes from England with rubber knobs on the soles that bit into the soft ground. I had on a new plaid skirt that also blew a little in the wind, and whenever this happened, the red and white and blue banners in front of all the houses stretched out stiff and said this is in a disapproving way. Uh, I'm actually going to pause there because there's a couple questions we can answer now. All right. Uh, what is unique about Wolfsheim's cuff buttons? Well, uh, he learns uh, that these are shaped like human teeth, and they're made out of ivory, human molars, to be more specific. Uh, number 13, what other spectacular fact does Nick learn about Wolfsheim? Well, if we go on back to his conversation with Wolfsheim, uh, here we go. Talks about how, so this is actually after the teeth, and he talks about, he leaves, talks about how he's the one who fixed the World Series back in 1919. So that is the spectacular fact of Wolfsheim. Fixing means uh, basically arranged what happened. Now, what seems to be Wolfsheim's connection with Gatsby? Well, they met after the war. Um, it's clear that uh, he has a great admiration for him. Now, number 15, who else does Nick run to at lunch? He runs into Tom Buchanan. Uh, from the previous chapters, we that Tom married to Daisy, and they had that whole thing in the apartments with Myrtle, who he's having an affair with, so craziness. All right, so these last chapters, we're going to finish up the, oh, sorry, last questions. We're going to finish up the chapter, and then there we go. Sorry. <clears throat> Here we go. Scrolling back down to conversation with Daisy. The largest of the banners and the largest of the lawns belonged to Daisy Fay's house. She was just 18, two years older than me, and by far the most popular of all the young girls in Louisville. She dressed in white and had a little white roadster, and all day long the telephone rang in her house. An excited young officer from Camp Taylor demanded the privilege of monopolizing her for that night. Anyways, for the hour. When I came opposite her house that morning, her white roadster was beside the curb, and she was sitting in it with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They were so engrossed with each other, they didn't see me until I was five feet away. Hello, Jordan, she called unexpectedly. Please come here. I was flattered she wanted to speak to me, because I was all the older girls I liked her. I admired her the most. Sorry. <clears throat> she asked me if I was going to the Red Cross and make bandages. I was. Well, then, would I tell them that she couldn't come that day? The officer looked at Daisy while she was speaking in the way that every young girl wants to be looked at sometime. And because it seemed romantic to me, I remembered the incident ever since. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I haven't laid eyes on him again for over four years, even after I met him on Long Island. Whoa, let me try that again. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I didn't lay eyes on him again for over four years, even after I met him on Long Island. I didn't recognize it was the same man. It was 1917. By the next year, I had a few bows myself, and I began to play in tournaments, so I didn't see Daisy very often. She went with a slightly older crowd, which she went with anyone at all. Wild rumors were circulating about her, 
Our mother had found her packing her bag one winter night to go to New York and say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas. She was effectually prevented. She wasn't on speaking terms with her family for several weeks. After that, she didn't play around with the soldiers anymore, but only with a few flat-footed, short-sighted young men who'd in town who couldn't get into the army at all. By the next autumn, she was gay again. Gay as ever. She had a debut after the armistice, and in February, she was resumed engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June, she married Tom Buchanan of Chicago, with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville had ever known before. He came down with a hundred people in four private cars and hired a whole floor at the Seal Bach Hotel. And the day before the wedding, he gave her a string of pearls valued at $350,000. I was bridesmaid. I came into her room a half hour before the bridal dinner, and I found her lying on her bed. It was a lovely June night in her flower dress, as drunk as a monkey. She had a little bottle of sartine in one hand and a letter in the other. Graduate me, she muttered. Never had a drink before, but oh, how do I enjoy it? What's the matter, Daisy? I was scared, I can tell you. I'd never seen a girl like that before. Here, dearest. She groped around on the waist back as she had taken her through the bed and pulled out a string of pearls. Take them downstairs and give them back to whoever they belong to. Tell them all Daisy's changed her mind. Say, Daisy's changed her mind. She began to cry, cried and cried. I rushed out and found her mother's maid. We locked the door and got her in a cold bath. She wouldn't let go of the letter. She took it into the tub with her and squeezed it up into a wet ball. And only let me leave it in the soap dish when she saw that it was coming to pieces like snow. She didn't say another word. We gave her spirits of ammonia, put ice on her forehead, and hooked her back into her dress. And half an hour later, when we walked out of the room, the pearls were around her neck. The incident was over. Next day at five o'clock, she married Tom Buchanan without so much as a shiver, and started off on a three month trip to the South Seas. I saw them in Santa Barbara when they came back, and I never thought I'd see a girl so mad about her husband. If you left the room for a minute, she'd look around uneasily and say, Where's Tom gone? And wear the most abstracted expression until she saw him coming on. Coming in the door, she used to sit on the sand with his head in her lap by the hour, rubbing her fingers over his eyes and looking at him with unfathomable delight. It was touching to see them together. It made you laugh in a hushed, fascinated way. That was in August. A week after I left Santa Barbara, Tom ran into a wagon on his Ventura Road one night and ripped a front wheel off his car. The girl who was with him got into the papers, too, because her arm was broken. She was one of the chambermaids in the Santa Barbara Hotel. So... His, uh, Tom's little affairs seems like they started a little earlier. The next day, April, Daisy had her little girl, and they went to France for a year. I saw them one spring in Canes and later in Deauville, and came back to Chicago to settle down. Daisy was popular in Chicago, as you know. They moved with a fast crowd, all of them young and rich and wild. But she came out with an absolutely perfect reputation, perhaps because she doesn't drink. It's a great advantage not to drink among hard-drinking people. You can hold your tongue, and moreover, you can time any little irregularity of your, irregularity of your own so that everybody else is blind, so they don't see or care. Perhaps Daisy never went in for art more at all, and yet there was something in that voice of hers. About six weeks ago, she heard that name, Gadsby, for the first time in years. It was when I asked you, do you remember, if you knew Gatsby and West Egg? After you had gone home, she came to my room and woke me up and sat, what Gatsby? And when I described him, I was half asleep. She said in the strangest voice, that it must be the man she used to know. It wasn't until then I connected this Gatsby with the officer in her white car. When Jordan had finished telling all this, we had left the plaza for half hour. We were driving in a Victoria through Central Park. The sun had gone down behind the tall apartments of the movie stars in the West 50s and the clear voices of girls gathered already gathered like crickets on the grass, rose through the hot twilight. I am the seek of Arby, and love belongs to me, a night when you're asleep and your tent dog creep. It was a strange coincidence, I said, but it wasn't a coincidence at all. Why not? As we bought the house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. But it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Pur purposeless splendor. He wants to know, continued Jordan, if you'll invite Daisy to your house in afternoon, let him come over. The modesty of the demand shook me. He had waited five years and bought a mansion where he dispensed starlight to casual moths so that he could come over some afternoon to a stranger's garden. Do I have to know all this before he could ask such a little thing? He's afraid. He's waited so long. He thought you might be offended. He's a regular tough underneath it all. Something worried me. 
Why didn't he ask you to arrange a meeting? He wants to see her. Wants her to see his house. She explained, and your house is right next door. Oh, I think you have expected her to wander into one of his parties some night. Went on Jordan, but she never did. Then he began asking people casually if they knew her, and I was the first one he found. It was that night he sent for me at his dance, and you should hear the elaborate way in which he worked up to it. Of course, I immediately suggested a luncheon in New York, and I thought he'd go mad. I don't want to do anything out of the way, he kept saying. I want to see her right next door. When you said you were a fr particular friend of Tom, she started to abandon the whole idea. He doesn't know very much about Tom, though he says he's read a Chicago paper for years, just on the chance of catching a glimpse of Daisy's name. It was dark now, and as we dipped under the little bridge, she put my arm I put my arm around Jordan's golden shoulder and drew her toward me and asked her to dinner. Suddenly I wasn't thinking of Daisy and Gatsby anymore, but of this clean, hard, limited person who dealt in universal skepticism, and who leaned back jauntily just within the circle of my arm. A phrase began to beat in the ears in my ears with a sort of heady excitement. There are only the pursued, the pursuing, the busy and the tired. And Daisy ought to have something in her life, murmured Jordan to me. Does she want to see Gatsby? She does not to know about it. Gatsby doesn't want her to know. You're just supposed to invite her to tea. We passed the barrier of dark trees and the facade of 59th Street. The block of delicate pale light beamed down into the park. Unlike Gatsby Tom Buchanan, I had no girl whose dismodded face floated along the dark cornices and blinding signs. So I drew up the girl beside me. Tightening my arms, her wan, scornful mouth smiled, so I drew her up again, closer this time to my face. And that's chapter four. So let's go ahead and scroll back a little, and we'll answer the rest of these questions. Alrighty. Jordan Baker tells... Oh, sorry. Uh, question 16. Jordan Baker tells a story, Nick's story, about Daisy Gatsby and Tom. Uh, summarize the story. So basically, uh, Jordan knew Daisy back when they were younger. She, uh, um, sorry, brain went out there. Uh, basically, she knew Gat. She knew Daisy way back when they were friends for a little bit. They were. And she even sort of knew Gadsby because he was that officer that she hung out with. And then later on, she ended up being the bridesmaid at uh, Daisy's wedding and found her drunk as a skunk and uh, didn't want to marry her. She got some letter. I mean, you don't know what the letter is about. Um, and basically, she ended up marrying Tom and then finding out he cheated on her and still she remains with him and... Yeah, so just summarize that story. Explain, uh, question 17. Explain the epigraph on the title page of the novel. What does it reveal about Gatsby and his love for Daisy? So if we go to question, go to the title page. Epigraphs typically are quotes and things that tie into the novel. So here we go. Then wear the hat, the gold hat, if that will move her. If you can bounce high, bounce for her too, till she cried. Love her. Gold-hatted, high-bouncing lover. It must have. You. Now, what does this mean for Gatsby and his love for Daisy? Well, you know, basically do whatever you can to earn this woman so that way she says, I want you. Basically what he says. Do we know why Gatsby has so many parties? Why does he throw them? Explain. Well... We learned this from Jordan, actually. So if we scroll back on down, I think it's 86. It's the end of the chapter. But Jordan's the one who sort of reveals the reason for all his parties. And it's Daisy. So, uh, here we go. Um, I think he's half expected her to wander to one of his parties some night. But she never did. And he began asking people casually if they knew her. And I was the first he found. So he has all these parties because he wanted Daisy to see what he had done. What new meaning do you see in the last two paragraphs of chapter one? What does Nick mean when he says there has not been merely the stars we aspired to on that June night? So if we go back to chapter one. Let's see. Where is it? Okay, so here's chapter one. And we want the last two paragraphs. So, scroll on down. Okay. 
All right, here we go. All right. Already it was a deep summer on ro roadhouse roofs, and in the front of Wadeside garages were new red gas pumps set out in pools of light. When I reached my estate at West Sag, I ran the car under its shed and sat for a while on an abandoned grass roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating in the trees and persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wandered across the moonlight, and turning my head, I watched to see it was not alone. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion, was standing with his hands in his pockets, regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movement and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it was Mr. Gatsby himself coming out to determine what share was his of our local heavens. I decided to call to him. Miss Baker had mentioned him at dinner and would do for an introduction, but I didn't call to him for a save of sudden intimidation that he was content to be alone. He stretched out his arms toward the dark waters in a curious way, and far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except for green light minute and far away. It might have been the end of a dock. When I looked once more for Gatsby, he had vanished. I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. So, <clears throat> question 19 asks you about the last two paragraphs of chapter 1, which we just reread. What does Nick mean when he says, and then it had not been merely the stars to which he had spied on that June night? He was looking for Daisy because he knows that she lived across for that time, across the bay for that so long, and then never found her again. So, something, you know, what new meaning do we get from these two paragraphs is that, well, he was always looking for Daisy. All of this has been about Daisy this whole time. All the parties, all the things that he'd been looking for, even staring out into the night at that green light as a dock edge. He was looking for Daisy. When Gatsby spoke to Jordan in his library in Chapter 3, he had already devised a plan involving Nick. What was it? Why had he not asked Nick directly? Well, as we discovered, because Jordan brings it up. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, I went too far. All right, so Jordan brings it up how uh, he wanted her to, or he wants Nick, nope, sorry, throw away. There we go. He wants to invite Daisy, he wants Nick to invite Daisy to his house, to Nick's house, so that way he can come over and meet her again, just by happenstance, so he can show her his house. Plan, he wouldn't ask Nick directly because uh, he wants her to see his house, and his house is right next door. He doesn't want him, he's afraid, you know, he's afraid he might be offended. Uh, you know, Jordan kind of mentioned he's kind of this regular person underneath it all. You know, he wants her to see what he's done with his life, he wants to impress her. For some reason he's just caught up on this girl and that's pretty much it for chapter four so make sure you cite make sure you write answers in complete sentences all right um as far as any questions go we have our zoom meeting starting tomorrow make sure you look over the questions i've asked you and uh for periods two and three and for periods one and four, you need to look at the questions Ms. Barr has and make sure you're ready for the Zoom meetings. Other than that, read your books, make sure you're caught up, and stay on your work, guys. And also, take some time for yourselves. Find something to do during this time, you know. Yes, we have to be stuck at home, but it doesn't mean we have to be stuck inside. It's a whole world out there. Yes, there's been rain, but we can go for walks. I've been walking my dog as often as I can, and it's great, actually. So, something to think about. See what you can make of this break, you know? Just because it doesn't have to be so bad. I hope things get better for all of you. I hope it continues to go well. Have a good rest of your time, and I will talk to you soon. Because I'm going to be sharing some videos of my own to see if you can beat the boredom. So, have a good one. Good luck.